What I want to talk about in this last talk has, we're answering the question, again, the leading question has been, uh, how could the city of churches be bombing him? How could we have a city that is both full of Christian churches uh, and yet have a, a city that is uh, known for its racial violence uh, and sometimes uh, horrific racial violence? Uh, it's a failure of the church's mission. That's what I was uh, indicating in the last talk. The church's mission is to be a kind of urban renewal, uh, Jesus ur urban renewal movement, the heavenly city among the cities of men, seeking to transform those cities. Uh, the church is to be a place where tribes and tongues and nations and peoples are uni united together in Christ by the Spirit so that they become one body and that unity is part of the mission of the church and should be reflected visibly in the way the church is evident to the world. Uh, so uh, at bottom, we have to say that the churches of Birmingham uh, failed to exhibit that. I do think that the white churches of Birmingham were uh, responsible in, uh, uh, for most of that, uh, uh, most of the uh, problem of uh, uh, mid-20th century Birmingham. Um, but why? Why did the churches fail to exhibit that unity? And I'm focusing here particularly on white churches. What were, what were inhibiting white churches from uh, seeking the kind of unity with black churches that they should have? And in the reading and study I've done, I've uh, come up with three factors that I think are relevant. I'm sure that there are others, uh, but these are the three that stood out from reading both historical historians' account of these events uh, and of event and of the current state of Birmingham, and also uh, some of the some of the writings of the period uh, from Martin Luther King Jr., for example, or from certain journalists who were in Birmingham and were, were writing about Birmingham. And I want to talk about three main factors that I think uh, figured into the white response to um, or, or the white uh, white church's uh, failures uh, in 20th century Birmingham. One is fear. The second is blame shifting. And the third is, I think, a more theological question, although those other two have theological dimensions to them. But the third is a theological issue. Uh, the churches often functioned with a truncated understanding of the gospel and of the church's mission. So those are the three things that I want to identify and fill out a little bit more. It's, was very, it's very common if you read um, commentators about Birmingham from the mid-20th century, and I'm thinking particularly around the time of the civil rights demonstrations. Uh, 1963 was the year of Birmingham. Martin Luther King was here for several months leading demonstrations along with local leaders and other national leaders. Uh, demonstrations that involved marches, mass arrests, um, sit-ins uh, in downtown businesses. They had organized these demonstrations to take place around the Easter shopping season. Uh, they cleverly realized that uh, they could hit uh, Birmingham businesses where they, where they would uh, feel it, that is, uh, in their bottom line. Uh, they realized that some 40% of uh, the um, business that was taking place in downtown, shop, uh, 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 downtown uh, uh, stores was African-American business. And by boycotting those stores and also by doing peaceful marches uh, around the city, they inhibited the businesses uh, downtown. Uh, people from the suburbs, white people from the suburbs, didn't want to go downtown because they didn't know what was going to happen. Even though the black demonstrations were peaceful, nonviolent, uh, it kept white people from shopping, and the black people were simply refusing to shop. And so it, was a, it created a, a significant uh, uh, reduction in the sales of uh, the downtown businesses and shopping centers during that period. Those businesses were also targeted, of course, because they had segregated uh, lunch counters. You could, uh, uh, blacks were welcome to go and shop in downtown department stores, but they couldn't have lunch in a downtown department store. Uh, they were welcome to go down and shop and spend their money, but they couldn't use the same bathroom that the whites used or get a drink from the same water fountain that the whites drank from. Uh, so those businesses had insti insti instituted the segregation uh, within their businesses. So particularly in 1963, uh, you have uh, 
that was when those demonstrations were taking place, the spring of 1973, 1963. Uh, and uh, there, that drew the attention of uh, journalists, uh, observers from around the country and really around the world that brought uh, attention to Birmingham. And a recurring theme of those accounts is that Birmingham was a city gripped by fear. Uh, Joe David Brown, for example, a Birmingham native who left Birmingham after working for a time with the Birmingham Post, I think the Birmingham Post Herald was the name of the, the uh, newspaper, uh, and he went on to a journalism career outside of Alabama, but he wrote a, an essay for the Saturday Evening Post in 1963 uh, entitled Birmingham, A City of Fear, and this was part of Joe David Brown. Uh, Joe David Brown um, I don't know if this will identify him for anybody, but he wrote a number of novels, one of which was turned into the film Paper Moon, for whatever that's worth. Uh, Joe David Brown in Birmingham, A City in Fear, wrote this, The people of Birmingham are no more backward than, many, than, other, sorry, than people in other southern cities. Although they don't like it, most of the leading business and professional people in Birmingham realize that integration is inevitable, and probably a majority of all, all of them feel that it is time to start making plans to, so, so that the transition can be made smoothly and peacefully, and as slowly as possible. The reason they don't speak up is quite simply fear. It's not the eye-rolling, quaking fear in police states. People in Birmingham prefer to call it by other names, but it is fear all the same. And then he went on, what kind of fear is it? What is the fear that they're, um, what, what, are, what are they fearful of? It's fear of being ostracized or called names. Negro lover would be one of the names. Uh, being ostracized in uh, Birmingham society. Fear of losing status, jobs, customers, clients, and advertising. More often than would seem possible among a hardy people, fear, fear of chili parlor hoodlums who have wrapped themselves in Confederate flags, although they're upholding no tradition but hate and no custom except violence. The violence of the vigilantes that I was talking about last evening was not only directed at blacks, but it was also directed at whites who took um, the step of speaking up on behalf of blacks in Birmingham. Uh, fear, he says, silences the voices of moderation. If this silence is broken, hoodlums are likely to look up the offender and dump filth on his front porch. It's fear that makes a newspaper man keep a loaded shotgun near his front door. It's fear that causes presidents of large corporations to speak with sweet reasonableness about the inevitability of integration, but then always add, this is off the record, of course. It's fear, he said, that inverted the relationship between Birmingham's leaders and those who elected them. Birmingham's, lead Birmingham's leaders, even those who were moderate and wanted to uh, change the segregated system, were unwilling to take steps to do that because they knew that that would cost them votes. And so they had to accommodate to the uh, opinions of the voters, which they may not share. Uh, George Wallace is probably best known for a couple of things. Governor George Wallace, governor of Alabama uh, in the 60s and into the 70s, known for a number of things. He's known for uh, his uh, inauguration speech at his first inauguration as governor Segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever was the line. He's known for his stand at the door of the uh, University of Alabama preventing the integration of the University of Alabama. What's less known is that George Wallace started as kind of a liberal on race issues in Alabama. Uh, he failed to get elected as a liberal uh, on race issues, as, a, as a, an advocate of integration. Uh, and uh, he became a, a, uh, a kind of an emblem, a symbol of segregation uh, in order to get political office, which he got and held for a number of terms. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. said the same thing about Birmingham. It was fear that caused the, uh, uh, caused the uh, people of Birmingham and the Christians in particular to, uh, to hold back from uh, speaking out. In Connor's Birmingham, he said, Bull Connor <coughs> excuse me, was the, one of the city commissioners during the demonstrations. It was Bull Connor who's in charge of the policemen. Uh, 
If you've seen pictures of the demonstrations, you've seen firemen with fire hoses knocking down uh, black demonstrators. You've seen police dogs uh, at, uh, uh, with uh, tr trying, to, trying to push back black demonstrators. Bull Connor was in charge of that operation to shut down the demonstrations. He started doing that when the jails got too full. There were so many people that were demonstrating. The jails got packed. They started putting people out in other places other than jails because there wasn't room in the jails anymore. And so instead of arresting people, they just tried to disperse them using the dogs and the fire hoses. But um, King says, in, in Bull Connor's Birmingham, the silent password was fear. It was a fear not only on the part of black oppressed, but also in the hearts of the white oppressors. It's fear on both sides. Guilt was part of their fear. There was also the dread of change, that all too prevalent fear which hounds those attitudes, those whose attitudes have been hardened by long winter of reaction. Many were apprehensive of social ostracism. Certainly, Birmingham had its white moderates who disapproved of Bull Connor's tactics. Birmingham had its decent citizens who privately deplored the maltreatment of Negroes but they remained publicly silent. It was a silence born of fear, fear of social, political, and economic reprisals. The ultimate tragedy, this is King still, the ultimate tragedy of Birmingham was not the brutality of bad people, but the silence of good people. One of the uh, 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 celebrated reports on Birmingham appeared in the... Uh, in uh, April of 1960, this was before the demonstrations began, in the New York Times, a New York Times reporter named Harrison Salisbury had spent some time in Birmingham and had been investigating what was going on in Birmingham, the racial situation in Birmingham, and uh, published on April 12th of 1960, published a, an essay in the New York Times called Fear and Hatred Grip Birmingham. And Salisbury uh, identified not just the fear of social ostracism and economic consequences, but he, he pinpointed uh, and drew attention to the uh, fear of uh, physical violence, which kept people quiet. Every channel of communication, he wrote, every medium of mutual interest, every reasoned approach, every inch of middle ground has been fragmented by the emotional dynamite of racism, reinforced by the whip, the razor, the gun, the bomb, the torch, the club, the knife, the mob, the police in many branches, of the state's apparatus. Um, Birmingham did not take kindly to being called <coughs> fearful. Uh, there were uh, uh, offended reactions in the local papers as, uh, at, in the aftermath of Salisbury's, uh, Salisbury's uh, article in the New York Times. Uh, there was an effort to sue the New York Times for the reporting. Uh, and there was, in fact, a, su a suit uh, brought a little bit later uh, against the New York Times because of an ad that had appeared about the Birmingham bus, uh, the Montgomery bus boycotts that appeared in the New York Times, uh, and the I think uh, some official in Montgomery filed suit that eventually got to the Supreme Court and became one of the uh, celebrated free press cases, uh, New York Times versus Sullivan, and that came out of somebody suing uh, the New York Times for defaming the city of Montgomery because of inaccurate statements in an ad uh, about the bus boycotts. Uh, but Birmingham did not enjoy being called fearful. Uh, many you know, people said, we're not afraid of anything. Uh, but commentators who look at Br Birmingham see fear, uh, fear on the part of blacks, certainly because they're under attack, fear on the part of whites uh, about change, fear on the part of whites about uh, trying to cooperate with the civil rights movement that would have labeled them uh, as uh, being on the wrong side of things. Another factor, I think, is a blame shifting, a habit of blame shifting. Uh, this is something that King also identified in his book, Why We Can't Wait. He says, for years in the South, the white segregationists have been saying that the Negro was satisfied. He claimed, we get along beautifully with our Negroes because we understand them. We only have trouble when outside agitators come in and stir things up. Uh, this was, uh, was mentioning this to somebody last evening. This was this uh, blame shifting was brought to perfection by Bull Connor. Uh, when people would come in with complaints about the city of Birmingham, his first question almost inevitably was, "Where do you live?" Uh, if you lived over the mountain, if you're not here from Birmingham, over the mountain is outside of the city of Birmingham. 
into the southern suburbs of Birmingham. If you lived over the mountain, you were not part of Birmingham and you had no right to appear before the City Commission of Birmingham. And so any kind of complaint or uh, uh, any kind of uh, ch challenge coming from, uh, even from the greater Birmingham area was considered outside agitation by Bull Connor. This blame shifting, not only, uh, it, they're, they're, they're blaming people like Martin Luther King, who's not a resident of Birmingham, uh, blaming other civil rights leaders who come in and, uh, and uh, uh, lead demonstrations. Um, that blame extends to people who are living over the mountain. <laughs> It extends to state authorities when the state of Alabama sends in state, state troopers in order to control crowds and to prevent violence. Birmingham sees that as a, an intrusion on their rights and uh, agitation by outside, outside agitators. Uh, when the federal government gets involved, as it did, of course, in uh, passing civil rights legislation, and the civil rights leaders were in constant contact with Bobby Kennedy, who was then Attorney General, uh, and had a line to the president, to President Kennedy. That's also outside agitation because it's interfering with the rights of Birmingham to solve its own problems. Uh, that blame shifting, I think, extended also to the way that whites often perceived the civil rights movement itself. Uh, and the civil rights movement within Birmingham and more generally uh, was often characterized as a, uh, uh, as a, uh, a radical movement uh, some, in some sectors of Birmingham and across the country, the civil rights movement would have been seen as a kind of communist, as a, as a communist plot. Uh, in fact, there were members of the Communist Party of the United States that were involved in the civil rights movement. That's, a, that's an established fact. There were people who were, um, who were, who were communists who were part of that. But that perception uh, of the movement as motivated by just a desire to disrupt or the desire to turn us into a, a Soviet state or something, uh, that led whites to miss what I think is the profoundly Christian motivation and shape of the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement, at least in, in its public declarations, was a movement motivated by a, uh, a, by a Christian uh, a, a, Christ, a Christian vision of relations between races by a Christian tactics, nonviolent tactics. Uh, throughout, it was, and I think whites, because they couldn't, because they're blame shifting, they're shifting up, these are outside agitators. This is someone other than my people who's making these problems. Uh, it wasn't, it was other Christians, but the whites didn't recognize that. Let me cite uh, just a couple of pieces of evidence of that uh, Christian motivation. Uh, this is from the Birmingham Manifesto, which was published in 1960, April 1963, uh, by, uh, signed by Fred Shuttlesworth, who was uh, the head of the uh, Alabama Christian uh, something for human rights. I can't remember what it stands for. I just have the letters down here. That uh, Birmingham Manifesto ends with this. This, is, this was prior to, or uh, around the time that the demonstrations were beginning in 1963. So we act today in full concert with our Hebraic Christian tradition, the law of morality and the constitution of our nation. The absence of justice and progress in Birmingham demands that we make a moral witness to give our community a chance to survive. We demonstrate our faith that we believe that the beloved community can come to Birmingham. Beloved community is a phrase that King often used, uh, but it's a, it's, a, a term, it's a phrase that comes out of Christian sources. When King talks about the civil rights movement, he compares it frequently to the uh, resistance, the nonviolent resistance of early Christians, which the uh, Romans took as an offense and reacted to with violence. Uh, those who became involved in the demonstrations in 1963 had to go through training in nonviolent tactics. That training involved uh, having to endure uh, insults, uh, beatings, not, not big beatings, but the, the leaders of the civil rights demonstrations would uh, put the people who were going to be in the demonstration through the paces, uh, call them niggers, insult them, hit them, so that they would learn not to respond, so that they would learn not to recoil and hit back. That was part of the training. 
Everyone who was involved in the demonstrations in Birmingham had to assign a pledge that they would they were committed themselves to nonviolent demonstrations. The first four items on that pledge, there were 10 items on the pledge. The first four items were these. Number one, meditate daily on the teachings and life of Jesus. Number two, remember always that nonviolent that the nonviolent movement in Birmingham seeks justice and reconciliation, not victory. I think that's an incredible statement. Walk and talk in the manner of love, for God is love. Pray daily, number four, uh, pray daily to be used by God in order that all men might be free. The demonstrators were doing this, doing what they were doing, having pledged themselves to meditate on Jesus, to act in love, and to pray. And many of the demonstrations actually were prayer meetings. And they were, uh, demonstrators would go out, the police would confront them, they would immediately kneel and pray. These were Christians, black Christians in Birmingham, black citizens of Birmingham, not outside agitators, and they were acting on the same gospel that the white churches claimed to believe. But they were treated as outside agitators. They're uh, blame-shifting to uh, somebody from elsewhere. Uh, King noted the irony of this blame-shifting when he said, there was a time when the Christians were the outside agitators. As soon as Christians entered a town, he wrote, the people in power become disturbed and immediately sought to convict the Christians of being disturbers of the peace and outside agitators. But the Christians pressed on in the conviction that they were a colony of heaven called to obey God rather than men. Small in number, they were big in commitment. They were too God intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated. By their effort and example, they brought an end to such ancient, ancient evils as infanticide and gladiatorial contests. King said, once the Christians were outside agitators, now that's not the case. Rather, the Christians who have power, the white Christians, treat demonstrations by Christians as outside agitation. The church, he said, is weak, ineffectual, is has become an arch defender of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's silence and often even vocal sanction of things as they are. Uh, people called him, called the, uh, uh, charge of the civil rights, the nonviolent demonstrations of the civil rights were provoking violence. Right, the, the blacks were not doing violence but they were provoking whites to respond with violence. And um, King asked, isn't this a little like blaming Jesus for, for getting killed? People accused him of being an extremist, and he l went off on a kind of a litany of different, this is in the letter, to, letter from a Birmingham jail, went on a litany of different uh, extremists, Jesus, Amos, Martin Luther, and so on, John Bunyan. And ended that by saying, perhaps the South, the nation, and the world are in dire need of creative extremists. Charles Morgan, a white attorney in Birmingham, uh, was the one, I think, who cut through the fog of blame shifting more effectively and powerfully than any other at the time. The day after the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing, well, that took place on September 15th, 1963, the day after that, Morgan gave an address to the Birmingham Young Men's Business Club. And he said, uh, all across Alabama, everyone knows about the bombing, all across Alabama, we're asking why. Why did this happen? Who's responsible for this? And he said, us. Every last one of us is condemned for that crime and the bombing before, before it and a decade ago, we all did it. 
He specifically targeted ministers, white ministers. The ministers of Birmingham who have done so little for Christianity call for a prayer at high noon in a city of lawlessness and in the same breath worry about the uh, city's image. Who's really guilty? This is Charles Morgan again. Who's really guilty? Each of us. Each citizen has not been consciously who has, not been con- who has not consciously attempted to bring about a peaceful compliance with the decisions of the Supreme Court. Every citizen who votes for the candidate with the bloody flag. Every citizen, every school board member, school teacher, principal, and businessman, judge, lawyer who has corrupted the minds of our youth. Every person in our community who has in any way contributed during the last several years to the popularity of hatred is at least as guilty, or more so, than the demented fool who threw the bomb. An unwillingness to accept responsibility for the actions of um, the white community. Morgan um, attacked that. Third, the third factor is a theological error, a truncated understanding of the gospel. This is something that uh, King brings up repeatedly in letter, letter from a Birmingham jail and some other writings. He accuses the ministers of pushing away the civil rights movement, saying this is not our responsibility to worry about racial relations within the city. Those are social issues, and the gospel doesn't address them. King wrote, I have watched many cities commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion, which makes a strain unbiblical distinction between body and soul, and between the sacred and the secular. He especially expressed his disappointment in white churches uh, in the letter uh, from the Birmingham jail. The letter from Birmingham jail, uh, in case you don't know, was a response to a public statement by a number of religious leaders in Birmingham accusing King of being unwise uh, in pursuing this, being an extremist, and he's, uh, the letter is uh, uh, at least motivated as a response to that, although it, it turns into something much bigger than that. But he, he says, I felt we would be supported by the white church, I felt that white ministers, priests, and rabbis of the South would be among our strongest allies. Instead, some have been outright opponents, refusing to understand the freedom movement and misrepresenting its leaders. All too, all too many others have been more cautious and courageous. Uh, sorry, I misread that. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the anesthetizing security of stained glass windows. The church's mission ends at the walls of the church. It's not God's urban renewal movement. The gospel is not about, <clears throat> it's not about the reconciliation of human beings with one another. It's not about tribes, tongues, nations, and peoples coming into the city of God. King spoke in, uh, wrote in uh, Why We Can't Wait, he, he describing the, the uh, rallies that he had prior to the beginning of the demonstrations in the spring of 1963. And he had a number of meetings with the local black ministers. Uh, And he had to convince the black ministers, too, that uh, they couldn't simply, uh, their their mission was not simply within the walls of the church. He condemned what he called a dry-as-dust religion that prompts a minister to extol the glories of heaven while ignoring the social conditions that cause men an earthly hell. And he called for a gospel that would address the social issues of the day and not just the spiritual issues. Fear, blame shifting, a faulty and truncated understanding of the gospel, at least the three, three of the factors that um, uh, went into the failure of the churches in Birmingham to be the church, to be the one church, to be visibly one. Ultimately, it is, I think, a failure of the church to be church. Charles Morgan in that speech that I mentioned, targets the ministers and uh, churches. Who's guilty? He says, it's all the Christians and all their ministers who spoke too late in anguished crimes against violence. And usually the violence is about, not not just about the violence of police against the black demonstrators. There were occasions when uh, blacks uh, began rioting in response to that. And then you have this outcry from white ministers about the violence of Birmingham. It's the coward, this is Morgan again, it's coward in each of us who clucks at admonitions. We have 10 years of lawless preachments, 10 years of criticism of law, of courts, our fellow man, 
a decade of telling school children the opposite of what civics textbooks say. We're a massive intolerance and bigotry and stand indicted before our young. We are cursed by the failure of each of us to accept responsibility by our defense as a, of a, a, an already dead institution. And King also condemned the church for its uh, practice of segregation, which he said is practiced as rigidly in the house of God as it is in the theater. Ancient history, you might think. Some of you remember these events. You were alive, living in Birmingham at the time that these things were happening. But uh, it's uh, 50 plus years ago. Where are we now? Charles Morgan said in that same speech that Birmingham is not a dying city. It is a dead city. That was in 1963. After that speech, Morgan began receiving death threats. This is a white lawyer speaking before the uh, Young Businessmen's Club in Birmingham, attacking the white majority for its tolerance of violence against blacks. And he gets death threats when he points this out. And the death threats were serious enough to him that he moved away from Birmingham closed down his law practice and spent the remainder of his career in Atlanta. Um, Birmingham, a dead city. Has it come back to life? Well, it's not 1963 anymore. There aren't church or house bombings. Uh, 1963 demonstrations were effective in achieving the fairly limited aims that they had, which was integration of lunch counters, uh, blacks having positions within the downtown shopping uh, sh uh, department stores, uh, blacks in the, on the police force, that took a little bit longer, but uh, those things have been achieved. Demonstrations didn't end up in a bloodbath, as many feared, which is, in retrospect, uh, one of the more remarkable things about the whole, about the whole series of events, because uh, it could easily have become truly a race war in Birmingham, and it didn't become that. For that, we can be thankful. Today, there are uh, mixed-race neighborhoods all over the Birmingham area, uh, even in uh, very white, the very white suburb of Gardendale, where I live. Uh, there are black families living in the neighborhood that's adjacent to our home. Uh, late, but uh, better late than never, the 16th Street bombers were brought to justice um, with um, then uh, U.S. Attorney Doug Jones, now Senator Doug Jones, uh, leading the prosecution of the last of those bombers uh, just um, 15 years ago or so. So we're not in 1963, and we can all be grateful for that. But I wonder and truly don't have an answer to this question. I wonder how far that, or how deep that renewal grows, goes. Uh, churches are largely segregated, and I don't simply mean that we have black and white churches. That may or may not be kind of a natural thing. It's that the black and white churches have very little to do with each other. We don't know each other. There's a spatial division within the city, a spatial division that is... Uh, uh, a racial division. There are integrated neighbor neighborhoods in the suburbs, but there are uh, areas of the city of Birmingham that are almost entirely black. Uh, there are um, uh, there's a there are uh, suburbs of Birmingham that are identifiably white suburbs. Uh, David Carrington, um, who was uh, I don't know if he still is, but has been a member of the Jefferson County Commission. Uh, had this to say back in uh, 2017. Uh, he says that we've made progress in Birmingham. When I look at Birmingham, I see beautiful terrain, rich natural resources, a community that was one of the most generous in the United States, re religious leaders who have opened their doors to all, civic leaders who believe we can do better, business community that's open for business. But what's holding us back from being a truly united community, he asks. And he says... Let's be honest with each other, despite tangible progress over the last 50 years, too many whites and blacks still do not trust each other enough to sit down at the same table 
and transparently share their hopes and dreams for the future, many of which are the same hopes and dreams. David Schur, uh, a local um, businessman who has a website called Comeback Town. Uh, David Schur is a Birmingham booster. He wants everyone to know that Birmingham is, uh, is not Birmingham anymore, that Birmingham has a lot of good things going on. But when he addresses the racial configuration of Birmingham today, he says that Birmingham still has um, racial divides. We in Birmingham, he says, are divided, have divided ourselves, our municipalities, and our agencies by race. Mountain Brook is white, the city of Birmingham is black. Vestavia Hills is white, the Birmingham Waterworks is black. Our state legislature is white, and so on. And he points out with some regularity that this is not the case in other southern cities. You don't have, um, you don't have uh, Nashville, he points out, Nashville isn't considered a black city. Because of the way that, partly because of the way that the city is structured uh, governmentally, you don't have separate entities, 35 separate entities, uh, where you have a, its own independent governments. Uh, another comment from, from David Sher, which I found uh, interesting, and I don't know if this gives us hope or what. Uh, he's citing Andrew Young, who spoke in Birmingham some, a couple years ago, and he pointed out, as many people have, that 11 a.m. on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the week. And then he went on to point out that 1 p.m. on Saturday afternoon during football season is the most integrated moment of the week. Uh, the University of Alabama football team, Auburn football team, are doing what the church is called to do, reconciling races, bringing us together into one body. Um, I don't, I, that's, those are just some observations. I, as I say, I look forward to hearing uh, if we have time from you all about what, uh, what the current state of things in Birmingham looks like. I think we still have a lot of work to do. I think the churches, although the churches are not at war with each other, I don't think the churches are hostile to each other. I just don't think black and white churches have much of anything to do with each other. And uh, that is not as it ought to be. Let me end with a couple of expressions of hope. The first one comes from W.E.B. W. E. Du Bois, uh, Behold the Land, an essay that he wrote, or I think it was a speech originally in 1946, where he pointed to the South as the place where there could be a renewal of American culture. Behold the beautiful land, he said, which the Lord has given you. Behold the land, the rich and resourceful land. He's talking about the South, and he's addressing African Americans. Here is a chance for young women and young men of devotion to lift again the banner of humanity and to walk toward a civilization which is free and intelligent, which will be healthy and unafraid and build in the world a culture led by black folk and joined by peoples of all races and colors without poverty, ignorance, and disease. That's about the South generally. In Why We Can't Wait, uh, Martin Luther King, writing in the aftermath of uh, the demonstrations in the spring of 1963, said this, I like to believe that Birmingham will one day become a model in Southern race relations. I like to believe that the negative extremes of Birmingham's past will resolve into the positive and utopian extreme of her future, that the sins of a dark yesterday will be redeemed in the achievements of a bright tomorrow. I have this hope because one, once on a summer day, a dream came true. The city of Birmingham discovered his conscience. That's a dream that I hope we all aspire to, but it's a dream that I believe we can realize only if the churches of Birmingham are what the churches should be. Congregations, communities that are recognizably, visibly members of one another as one body, bearing one another's burdens, weeping when others weep, rejoicing when others rejoice, sharing the gifts that we have for the upbuilding of the whole body. Let's pray together. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and his promise to his church that he is at work, that he will be with us until the end of the age. We thank you that he is at work to bind us together that he is at work to bring nations into harmony with one another and with you, Father. And we pray that here in Birmingham that you would give us grace 
uh, to have insight into our current situation in Birmingham. Give us grace to spot those areas, to see those areas where we need to uh, repent or where we need to redouble our efforts to express the unity that you've called us to. We pray that in this city that, uh, that your church would truly be one, that the world may see that you sent your son to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.